So my presentation will deal with an ethnographic perspective or an anthropological approach to visual culture. And um, it's on the one hand concerned with the production and analysis of visual information about human societies. And on the other hand, um, it's investigating and comparing uh, culturally diverse forms of visual communication within uh, these societies. So it's uh, on the one hand an external and on the other hand an internal perspective. And I try to combine these two. Um, and I was especially interested in finding out how ethnographers shape the picture of the others um, in visual terms, using photography and film as research tools. But, um, yeah, first of all, maybe I have to say, I, I didn't go much further than the 1970s and 80s, because that was when photography and film were like a predominant media, and afterwards, I'm not so much concerned with digital media, so it's more about visual media. But I found a research uh, of uh, some students at the University of uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, it was uh, uh, published in 2000, and uh, it's uh, concerned with the use of new media in everyday life. So this is like my meeting point with our um, yeah, in this uh, study, this is the pictorial outcome of one of the students' research. Her name is uh, Martina Andres, and she was asking about the relation of people to their computer, and in her case, to the material object itself. So she was asking questions like, uh, what do people use it for, and uh, what are the daily routines, or which part of their personality is uh, or productive thinking is stored inside this object, and then like, what is the relation of people to this object uh, while it's containing so much of their personality or like of their pr production? Um, yes. Uh, inspired by Deleuze, she uh, suggests that the human being is connected to this object in a feedback loop. That means uh, with the computer, people adopt and record the pictures and conventions of the environment into their daily practice. Um, they add some kind of inscription of their own personality. That's a fuzzy, but... <laughs> um, yeah, so they're like adding a part of their own identity and send it back into society. And uh, here again it is treated and comes back in a permanent process of exchange. So, uh, in the use of computers, the concept of interaction plays a paramount role. And that interaction is what I focused on um, during my research of the older media. So, I switch now <laughs> back to photography. And, um, yeah, I was uh, focusing on the interrelationship of um, the visual media, so like photography and film, and um, the producers and the actual object of um, observation. So um, interaction together with communication is especially important in ethnographic research or in ethnographic fieldwork, respectively participant observation, which maybe some of you might heard. Um, it's a method for anthropological and social research that developed since uh, the 19th century, since the late 19th century, and was first theoretically outlined by Danislav Malinowski, you see him here, um, in 1922. The, traditionally, an ethnographer would try to integrate into an alien society and to experience the everyday life of people along with them. Um, he was to gain an inside view, the so-called emic perspective, and uh, he participates in activities, learns the language and the behavior of the group he's investigating. Um, so he usually establishes relationships with his informant. And um, according to Malinowski, the aim of the ethnographer is to grasp the native's point of view, his relation to life, to realize his vision of his world. Um, but on the other hand, uh, at the same time, the ethnographer holds an external perspective. 
or so-called ethic perspective um, that is gained during his academic training and that should allow him to analyze his experiences and thus to analyze the native point of view. Um, his aim would be to integrate all the details he observes and synthesize it into a consistent construction of the picture of the other people and their behavior and social structures. And this picture is what is then taken back into his own society and uh, academic environment, mostly in the form of a written analysis. Um, okay, now to give you a more vivid and uh, the first visual impression of what the field work is like, so what the actual work of a traditional ethnographer would be like, um, I show you a short film about participant observation. Um, it's showing uh, the main principles and methods of investigation. It was uh, made by Alan McFarlane, this guy. Um, and uh, he's a professor of anthropological science at the University of Cambridge. Actually, the film is 53 minutes long and uh, takes the viewer through the whole process of fieldwork from getting into the plane to coming back home. Um, and um, the target audience would be students about to go abroad somewhere to research. Um, the film is filmed in Nepal, in a Gurung village, uh, where McFarlane had been researching for over 15 years, so he's quite in, in that uh, collective, in the village he was researching. And I cut out around 10 minutes uh, in which he deals with the problem of communication and the strategies of observation, methods to gain and record and analyze it. It's not just language, but the whole body. Communication with children is often the easiest to start with. Tickling, them trying to distract you. All done with the body, really. Children are used to the difficulties of communication with adults, and a lot of it is physical. They also tend to have much more time for teaching the anthropologist and so here Prem Kumari is teaching Sarah the names of the different fingers father finger mother finger brother finger sister finger and the children themselves of course are at school so they're being taught and they also get pleasure in teaching others here they're teaching Sarah how to pronounce Nepali letters And one learns from adults and young men. Here, an ex-Gurkha officer is teaching Sarah Nepali. The most difficult thing, though, is actually practicing it and going out and having the courage when you know how hardly any of the language to speak to people. And Sarah's trying out her few words on a friend who's just had a baby. And at a wedding, trying out talking to a young lady who shows the difficulty. She half understands, looks around, says what she's saying, ah, yes, and then again looks rather embarrassed at not being able to understand. But if you have some photographs to talk about, this is my aunt, this is my uncle, animation and excitement. You can observe in different ways. One is to sit and watch someone and then ask them a set of questions about what they're doing. Why are you making this rice mat? How often do you make them? How long do they last? What are they used for? And sometimes if it's a good relationship. They will ask you questions back. Do, what do you sit on in England? Do you have these things? What do you put on the ground? And so you fill in questions about their various activities. You can ask them about their agriculture when they're beating maize. How much did maize did you get from a certain field? Was it a bad year for monkeys? And so on.
sila yun. Si Yuma. Si Yuma. Si ka ibang ba'y? Lea ayo. Si ka. Yele. Munon lea ayo ba? Si ka. And before complicated rituals, it's very helpful to talk to the shaman here, Yajung Kromje Pochu, very distinguished shaman who is explaining a day-long ritual he'll do which in which he'll fight against witches and do various activities and he's laying out the structure of the occasion so that we can understand it better. He speaks English. And then there are the formal interviews. I have done a series of a dozen interviews, 20 minutes or so, on film with Dilmaya, talking about, very frankly and openly, about all aspects of her life, private, personal, public, directly as sister to brother. Just sitting with a camera on my knee like this, relaxing, talking. This is where the real field work takes place. And at the end, I thank her, and she's amused and says she's never been filmed like this before. And I suggest she looks through the camera lens at me and sees what I've been filming. This is what she saw. I'm going through a few more questions with her. And at the end, say, press the red button, uh. and then you can turn it off. Uh. The most important part of the methodology in the field. We record everything in small notebooks. We sit talking to groups of people or single individuals and jot down the gist of their answers there. Just headings, just notes, which will be expanded later into the fieldwork diary. Just a tiny notebook which is not obtrusive and which, if lost, doesn't matter too much because there are lots of them trying to look at something and understand it, asking people what's happening. If you're very fortunate, then you will find an informant like this. This is addressing Gurung, my other adopted father, who is a mine of information. He carries in his head the whole social, economic, genealogical structure of this village and for year after year he downloaded this to us so that we had a complete census, a complete inventory of all the possessions, all the wealth, all the status, everything about the village. And hour after hour with him we transcribed this and later put it into a computer. So we're checking the field surveys in the who owns what and who is sharecropping what. Long, arduous work often punctuated with colds, as you see with the toilet paper. Really grinding work, but it makes the difference between superficial and real to in-depth field work of a particular kind. A total reconstruction of a, a village, which is what we've been trying to do for 30 over 30 years, addressing trying out his English using one English word and much amused by that. <laughs> so we check the census and genealogies each year. They're put into the computer, updated, and then brought back on the following year. The census is actually gathered by going house to house to house and checking what's happened, whether there have been any new babies, anyone's died, anyone's gone abroad, making little notes. This is in the lower caste. There are tailors and blacksmiths living on the edge of the village as well as the gurungs in the middle. And this is in one of their houses.
and then collating it all. A great jigsaw puzzle which Sarah mainly sorts out, getting it all interrelated, often working with informants. This is the old man's son, who's now in Hong Kong and who speaks good English, and he's explaining what's happened in a certain household. Oh, yes. Let's have a look. We've got uh, House 91. House 91, here we are. This is... Dil Bahadur is... That's at Lama Kev. He right. de he's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Myla is Gopal Bo Singh, yeah. or Gopal Singh. Yeah. Bo Bopal. Bo is it Myla? Myla. So Myla. Long, long... Myla's son or Myla work, himself? But really Myla, Myla. Essential. Myla. So, Gopal Singh. No for this kind of classical community study, ah, historical yeah. community study fieldwork. Another way of gathering information is to show people photographs, ask them where the people are now, who they have married and so on. Here we see some tailors and gurungs mixed together, showing the caste system is not very strict in this area. One's on the left. Uh, Tailors and the others are good. And we're being told, oh, so and so has gone off to Bombay. And a photographic record. We've photographed every person in this village, often several times. They dress up, they like to dress up in their best clothes as here. And that shows another example of the way in which you distort life a little bit. Often they just go on with their activities, but sometimes they like to dress up and they often don't like to be filmed or photographed looking scruffy. But here, recording uh, an occasion when some old men came and had a meal with us. The most important of all the recording devices is the fieldwork diary, which has to be written up for an hour or two every day, taking the information from the small diaries, notebooks, and reflecting on it, expanding it, often interrupted by children. It must be done within a few hours of taking the notes, and this diary is kept very carefully in the house so it won't get lost. It shouldn't be carried around. And it's also too large. It obtrudes between you and the people you're talking to. But it is the key document, and we, in the end, put all this into the computer as well. Um, yeah. Now, uh, I focus on the re relationship of ethnographers that observe others and the visual media that they use to improve their ability to create meaning. Um, yeah, I'll start now a little more backwards, going to the early history, the prehistory of uh, social anthropology. Um, yeah, before photography was invented, the imagery of people was uh, transferred to our societies with drawings of adventurers and explorers like this. Um, even strange <coughs> pictures or um, people were uh, exhibited in what I would call freak shows um, in like, markets and as soon as photography was invented it was extensively used to portray these others as uh, wild or noble savages and to bring them home from the colonies um, and again exhibit them in world fairs in Europe and North America um, with the beginning of colonial tourism, they could even be brought home as postcards by tourists. Um, so, uh, um, when the discipline was established in the late 18th century, these imageries were partly included into the first ethno uh, ethnological um, writings in the first ethnological studies. Um, in these times, they didn't do field work. They were uh, comparing ideas and descriptions that mostly derived from expeditions of or colonists or uh, missionaries' records. So um, the scientific approach 
to um, uh, researching different cultures succeeded ideas of exoticism, scientific racism and social Darwinism. The world was divided into those who organized and rationalized and uh, those who were surveyed and those who were subjects of this surveillance and who were mapped out. Um, yeah, maybe it's uh, best to um, characterize the early photography with what Susan Sontag um, says, and she says that she considers photography as an act of violence as it degrades subjects to become objects and it transforms people into objects that can be symbolically possessed. So it was possible to possess these others. Um, the observers were in possession of pictorial truth um, that was represented in the mechanically produced and therefore objective of evidence. So these early machines were yeah, creating objective evidence uh, in the ethnographer's point of view, or like the early researchers, scientists. In contrast to these early images and conceptualizations, the practice of presenting visual materials was assigned to descriptive studies of native customs in the later ethnographic monographs. So um, the changes in paradigms and the conception of the um, scientific um, research in this discipline becomes most uh, visible through the absence of visual messages. Um, the main outcome of an ethnographic research would be a written analysis, merely illustrated with photographs. And uh, this photograph had no epistemological value without the written context. Most of the photographs that field workers produced during the months and years of participating and observing other people's lives, finally merely served as an aide de mémoire, similar to written field notes, to help reconstitute events in the mind of the ethnographer. The ethnographer's mental qualities, shaped and transferred his experiences, revived with the help of field notes and often hundreds of photographs into the form that were conventional for science, into charts and words that described the social structure and customs of the other people. The discourse of visual representation mainly shifted to museums and was principally excluded from scientific approach and reflection. Yeah. Jay Ruby um, writes in an introduction to visual anthropology that ethnographic photography is a practice without the well-articulated theory or method. It logically proceeds from the belief that culture is manifested through visible symbols embedded in gestures, ceremonies, rituals, and artifacts situated in constructed or natural environments. Culture is conceived of as manifesting itself in scripts with plots involving actors and actresses with lines, costumes, props, and settings. And the cultural self is the sum of the scenarios in which one participates. So, um, this picture. He emphasizes the antagonism between the ethnographic activity of taking pictures and the lack of literature that demonstrates that anthropological picture taking is scientifically justifiable at all. Um, so, yeah, the question of photographic reality and representation was again raised with the broad popularization of film and attempts to create a distinct ethnographical film. Um, during the 1960s and 70s. Um, in a debate between Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson, uh, they were a famous couple of anthropology, so they um, yeah, uh, did research together. Um, she argued that photographic record uh, for scientific research would be, should not be altered. And uh, he answered that it doesn't exist unaltered. Um, at all, and it should be an art form in his point of view, so it was like a little fight between them. Um, in the 1970s, Mead's outlook on the rising practice of filming was to preserve the disappearing types of behavior and forms 
that not only would permit the descendants to repossess their cultural heritage, but that would also give our understanding of human history and human potentialities a reliable, reproducible and reanalyzable corpus. She insisted on long sequences um, from one point of view, um, because she said that um, they could provi provide the unedited stretches of instrumental observation. So, like, to put the camera in one place and leave it running, like this one would be objective from her point of view. And uh, she asked for prosaic control and systematic filming and videotaping. Now, what, as finer instruments have taught us about the cosmos, so final recording of these precious materials can illuminate our growing knowledge and appreciation of mankind. But, um, despite these hopes, the main point of critique on photography and film were their selectiveness and subjectivity. Uh, and these are the reasons why they were rejected as valuable empirical data. Um, both media, when they are, who are used in fieldwork, are predominantly influenced by the viewpoint and perspective of the photographer or filmmaker who chooses, like, in the end, when and where to press the button. Um, yeah, Jay Ruby puts it like this. Um, when an anthropologist, or anyone else for that matter, takes a picture, he follows a set of culturally specific conventions which determine the selection of subject matter and the treatment of that subject. He says that picture taking for ethnographic purposes is best understood as a communication activity. So, on the other hand, the subject may show a certain attitude towards being photographed that can as well influence the work. Um, they may follow another set of on-camera behavior um, which also shaped the photographic presentation. And um, yeah, in the end, it's impossible to stay invisible as a photographer, even less as a filmmaker. So nowadays, in some approaches, this is regarded as a capacity of ethnographic film, as the filmmaker may seek to provoke actions and uh, simultaneously record them. The impossibility of invisibility, it can gen generally be applied to the ethnographer as a person. Like you have seen, like two people obviously coming from a totally different cultural background in another uh, cultural group. They are, um, yeah, of, um, the, the people recognize them. It's not possible to stay invisible and to just watch or to totally integrate into a different society. Um, so, the subjects recognize that they are in focus of someone different, and they may act different, they might tell the researcher what they think he wants to hear, or show him what they might want to show. Um, so now, interaction becomes relevant again. And uh, with the mechanical production of images, it shifts from the person, the observer, to the medium of observation. Um, yeah, this interaction is determined by sight as much as the image and its context. So that anthropologists uh, started using these media and exploring the human vision in itself and uh, tried to find differences again. So, um, um, yes, the consequences of media on so-called pre-media, even though they're not, like they have had contact with media, but not in that way, of pre-media people, um, became visible in a research that partly involved a group in Papua New Guinea, um, a tribe there, uh, in the whole production of a film on themselves. So they were in introduced to making film and then they were uh, co-producers and also co-filmers so there was one filmmaker that came from outside and others uh, yeah native filmmakers we call it um, yeah it was uh, made in 1969 
And um, in 1973, Edmund Carpenter, who was one of the um, researchers, published his book, Oh, What a Blow That Phantom Gave Me. He writes, um, I think media are so powerful they swallow cultures. I think of them as invisible environments which surround and destroy old environments. Sensitivity to problems of culture, conflict and conquest become, me become meaningless. Here for media play no favorites. They conquer all cultures. So now I would like to show you another short film of how media conquer all uh, cultures. In Kandangan village, the people became co-producers with us in making a film. The initial proposal came from us, but the actual filming of an initiation ceremony became largely their production. In this area of the Seafolk, the male initiation rite is absolutely forbidden to women, in the past on penalty of death. Our chief cameraman was a woman. It never occurred to us to ask if she might film. We assumed such a request would not only be denied, it would offend. But the Kandangan elders asked if she was good. And we told, yes, better than any of us. They requested that she offer it to him. Not only did they permit her inside the sacred enclosure, but they showed her where to position her equipment, helped her move it, and delayed the ceremony while she reloaded. I'm convinced she was allowed to witness this rite, not because she was an outsider, but solely because her presence was necessary for the production of the best possible film.
The initiates were barely conscious at the end of their ordeal, but they grinned happily when shown Polaroid shots of their scarified backs. to have the soundtrack played back to them. They then asked that the film be brought back and projected, promising to erect another sacred enclosure for the screening. Finally, they announced that this was the last involuntary initiation, and they offered for sale their ancient water drums, the most sacred objects of this ceremony. The film threatened to replace a ceremony hundreds, perhaps thousands of years old. Yet film could never fulfill the ceremony's original function. That function was to test young men for manhood and weld them forever into a closed, sacred society. Now the ceremony, and by extension the entire society, could be put on a screen before them, detached from them. They could watch themselves. No one who ever comes to know himself with the detachment of an observer is ever the same again. As you heard, they it was an initiation ritual. Like it's very common in societies to, uh, like when boys become men, they have some rites. And um, yeah, they wanted to stop the rite at all because it was filmed. Because they had, they could possess it in a different way. And um, that's what's possible to happen if cultures are uh, confronted with their own imagery. With their own picture. So I draw a short conclusion that uh, everybody who has ever seen a photograph of himself becomes aware of observation, and everyone who has taken a photograph of film, from my perspective, cannot but see himself as a part of it, as one recognizes the photo that one took. If I see a photo that I take, I know, like, I took it and I know which perspective it is from. And uh, the observer becomes obvious, even if he's physically absent in the picture, when people start interacting with the camera. So it's like even more when people look into the camera that there's someone behind it. Um, so this interaction focuses on both on the observer and on the camera as the creators of this possibility to view oneself and the other people. And so with the possession of pictures of oneself and others, the individual picture and the vision changes. Okay, and now um, to come back to the beginning, maybe as a point for a discussion, what happens when the observer disappears and uh, the interaction is with the material object, with the technical object, that and the possibilities appear in communication with the physically obscure counterpart like the computer. That's my question. That was it. Thank you.